What's an unhealthy obsession people have? Story 1. Work and productivity. Everybody needs a break. Not just every once in a while, but often. When I was working in a warehouse, I would always go and eat outside under a tree. My co-workers couldn't figure out why. It's because I don't want to sit at a table where everyone complains about the workday and just overly consumes office gossip and politics constantly. It's draining. I'm just here to work and go home. I'm outside to get away from all of you. I'm an introvert. I need to recharge. I just want peace and alone time. Yet they would all say, he thinks he's too good to sit in the break room. Many co workers would try to get me to play on Xbox with them after hours. When I agreed and played, 90% of what they said was recapping the workday, what made them mad, and work gossip. Don't you want to separate yourself and unwind from all of that when you clock out and go home? I think there are a lot of people that peaked in high school who act like this. They lost the thrill that came with high school drama, so now they talk about their co-workers in the same way a teenager talks about people they go to school with. Story 2 complaining about something while needing to be right about it. People love to complain about everything and seem to enjoy being willfully ignorant to how things work or why things are the way they are. They always have to be a victim of the situation. Quick example, my friend is a mechanic and a really good one, also one who won't rip people off. A lady came in with her fancy Mercedes SUV and some part needed to be replaced. Naturally, it was pretty expensive. She absolutely lost her mind and went into a whole rant about how she was being wronged. He was lying and it was too expensive for no reason. It shouldn't have failed and she was going to sue Mercedes. He tried, to no avail, to explain that with a vehicle that costs over 100 k the parts will still inevitably fail and will not be cheap in any way. That's why it's not a 20 k car. She had no interest in learning anything that day. She was right since she clearly was the expert and he was wrong. After she became increasingly rude, it became clear it was a lost cause. He eventually told her if she doesn't want to understand why the parts are expensive and that paying for maintenance on a vehicle like this is going to be expensive, she should just go buy a used 90s Civic and it'll have cheap repairs. The point is, many people have no desire to learn anything about many of the things they use on a daily basis. They'd rather just complain and post on social media how a certain product or whatever is terrible instead of maybe learning something for a change. When I deal with people like this, the only thing I can think of is that they were never told no as a child. Story 3 professional sports. Don't get me wrong, I love my own teams, but if you are rioting following a victory or loss by your team, then it is time to seek counseling. I'm a self-proclaimed Fairweather fan. I generally don't watch sports at all, but if any of my state's local teams start making a good run, I may get engaged and watch some. It blows my mind that people's days are ruined when their team loses, or maybe they punch a wall or destroy some other's property, or even worse, get in a physical fight with some other fan from an opposing team. These people need something more meaningful in their lives they're getting more upset than an actual member of the team. Pathetic. I'm of the opinion that spectator sports, especially team ones, provide an outlet for human tribal instincts. People can root for a team and convince themselves they are somehow actually part of the team and therefore able to create us and other groups that are largely fictional with battles. Notice how sports fans use the word we a lot when talking about things the team does. It's silly. The TV works one way. They don't even know you exist and would have scored either way. You are in no way part of the team. Don't don't even get me started on college sports. Someone who's only set foot on a campus to get to a stadium, bragging about how their team beat the team of the school I got my degree from? How rich. Story 4 an obsession with their social media image. A friend of mine's mother spends almost every waking hour on Facebook and Instagram. She's constantly updating the world on her life. My friend has had to stop sending her pictures of his children because they would immediately end up on her page. She's also fallen for a number of scams, thankfully stopped by her son before she lost money. It seems the only source of validation in her life are the upvotes and likes from friends, relatives, and strangers. I have some family members like this. They have a big family and put up all these professional pictures of them on Facebook looking super nice and close and loving, like a really tight-knit family. The guy writes public messages on his wife's Facebook page telling her what a great wife she is. That all sounds great if it were true. Behind the scenes, she doesn't watch the kids. He doesn't want to watch them either, but he does. They both physically fight and scream at each other and call each other horrendous names. They both intentionally try to get their small kids to curse and make racial slurs. They're complete a-holes to everyone they know unless they are equally as crude and racist as them. The wife literally just lost 
her job for bullying another woman in her office and making sexual gestures towards the men working there. But I guess when you're a conventionally decent, normal-looking couple living in the upscale suburbs and making enough money, you can get away with anything. Nobody questions a thing. It's wild. When I see people who clearly try very hard on their social media presence, it just comes across as extremely impersonal. And that's fine if that's what you're going for, but I can't stand people calling their personality their brand. You are not a brand. You're a human being. Sorry. Story 5. TikTok, Instagram Reels, YouTube Shorts, etc. Videos that shorten our attention span. My eight-year-old nephew has played more games in his life than I have in my entire life. He hasn't beaten them all, but there's so many games out there he just plays till he gets bored and then moves on. I once argued that video games had a good problem-solving aspect to it for young kids, but now I feel like it just teaches them how to look up solutions or just move on. It's sad when these apps take addiction research and turn it into a business model. There's a reason why they all started giving you meaningless notifications of something you don't care about. It's because they put it in the same notifications as the things you do care about. I had no idea how harmful these things were until I realized that I could no longer commit to watching any movie, even if it was only an hour long. Well that, plus all the nights I've accidentally scrolled my way to 4am. Story 6 needing to be in a relationship no matter the cost. I've been single for years now, and I'm not exaggerating when I say it's the happiest I've been in my entire life. I wish I could go back and tell younger me that she didn't have to spend so much time and energy on people who would never treat her the way she deserved. It's so much better for your self-esteem and mental health to treat yourself the way you deserve to be treated, rather than hope someone else is going to come along and do it for you. I dated a guy once and we were talking for a while. He said he already had a girlfriend but wasn't happy with her. I suggested, more for his benefit than mine, he should break up with her. He said he would if I dated him. I told him to think more about himself than me. He couldn't be single, so he wanted to date me to make sure we were compatible, so he could leave his girlfriend and go straight to me. Needless to say, we stopped talking after that. I don't understand how people can jump from relationship to relationship. I get that it comes from not wanting to be alone and that loneliness is terrifying to some people, but it's still so illogical because people like that have no idea who they are. When you get into a new relationship, you don't have anything to talk about except your last relationship and why it ended. Those are important things to discuss with your partner, but when they are the only things you know about yourself, there's an issue. You should know what you want in life, and it shouldn't be whatever your partner wants just so that you can be together. Story 7 People are obsessed with youth and some people will do anything to maintain its appearance. The ironic part is that a lot of the things people do to make themselves look younger and better just makes them look worse. I live in LA. I work somewhat connected to the entertainment industry. More times than I could enumerate, stunning women and a number of great looking men have slowly distorted their faces and figures into oblivion. In the span of 18 months, many are entirely unrecognizable. Literally, I've gone to events, bumped into people, and I didn't know who they were until I heard their voice. They start looking like this homogenous mass of the altered. Story 8 alcohol. It seems especially prevalent with wine. Alcohol is so normalized and it's very weird when you stop and think about it. There are definitely people who can enjoy it occasionally and responsibly, but at the end of the day, it's mostly just poison. I went full sober and went to AA because I was drinking too much. With AA and my newfound sobriety, I found that I was obsessing over not drinking. I realized after a short bit that I had far deeper issues than the drink. I stayed sober and went to therapy. I completed the CPT sessions I enrolled in, decided that the gym was a fantastic complement to my life and well-being, and then slowly changed other habits in my life, I ended up quitting AA after six months because it felt more of a hindrance to me than a help. I ended up drinking again, but I only have one or two total a week, only when I'm out at a show or at dinner, never alone, never at a bar, and never at home. I'm not knocking AA or any other substance abuse group. It just wasn't right for me. I had used alcohol to cope with deeper, darker issues, and I had to quit the drink in order to address said issues in a healthy manner. However, I absolutely do suggest going to AA meetings when you first stop drinking. Being in the company of others who have had issues with alcohol and hearing their stories greatly helps and allows one to refocus their life in a healthy environment. Story 9 they need to brag about how little rest you got between working. We get it. You got three hours of sleep. That sucks. And it's not the flex that you think it is. I mean, the people that like to one-up each other for how little rest they get, like one person saying, I got five hours of sleep, and another person saying, five? I only got three. That doesn't make you a better employee. It's just sad. Sleep deprivation literally accelerates the rate at which you age. It's like bragging about smoking a lot. It's worse than that. Studies in the last couple of years have shown it drastically increases your risk of early onset dementia and all 
Alzheimer's. One study claimed a single all-nighter did damage comparable to that of a concussion. Not sleeping is literally giving yourself brain damage. I did mortgages for a while at a credit union, and it originally was the credit union of an aircraft manufacturer. Some of these blue-collar guys are crazy. I've never seen guys who make so much money but are still basically living paycheck to paycheck. Like some dude was making 150 k a year as an aircraft painter, averaging 90 plus hours a week, by the way, and this dude had a debt to income ratio that I couldn't even come close to with a mortgage. Lots of them were like this too. One would make around 2 to 4k per week and was still overdrafting his account often. It's insane. All of them were older too. They'd been on the job 30 years. All these guys would talk about how their friend retired at 60 something and was dead the next year. And some of the guys who were like 60 years old were still paying on their houses. Houses they've lived in for over 30 years. Meanwhile, the younger guys at the same plant had themselves a little more collected. Most of the time, I did a mortgage for a dude who was crazy smart and was 100% gonna manage the place at some point. He was already making around 80k plus, but was only working 50 to 60 hours instead of 90. But he was stashing his money away like crazy. Already had his house paid off and was looking to buy up to a larger one because his family was growing, and he was only like 28. I think this is a sickness in America. It definitely happens in other countries, but people bragging about working more than 40 hours a week is extremely common in America. Americans are taught from a very young age about work ethic and why not having work ethic makes you a bad person. We're expected to get our first job as soon as we're legally allowed to or else we'll never amount to anything. I think a lot of Americans eat this up too because of the need to feel special. Working more hours than two full-time jobs combined might make a person feel needed, like their workplace would collapse without them. But this isn't true for 98% of careers. These big employers view people as disposable and replaceable robots. Nothing more. Please like and subscribe if you've made it this far. I hope you'll enjoy the rest of the video and have a wonderful day. Story 10 their phones. It's one thing to keep yourself busy. It's another to never let yourself be bored. Being bored is important sometimes. It makes you think or helps clear your head depending on the situation. Phones make it ridiculously easy to never let yourself get bored to the point where it's not healthy. This is definitely a real thing. It was causing issues with my wife when I was so hooked on my phone that I had it out at all times. She finally got through to me that the phone does not come to the dinner table anymore. We have a toddler and I found myself looking down at my phone a lot still. My wife would constantly say, she's trying to show you something, and I'd look up and my little girl was just looking for me to pay attention. That's what got me. It's an eye-opener. I deleted social media from my phone and have made huge improvements. I found myself doing weird stuff at first, like compulsively checking my email or my stocks, just an excuse to open an app out of habit. That slowly went away. I do still use social media on occasion, but not like I used to. I'm not perfect, but I've come a long way. Story 11 an obsession with each other's lives. Just let people live. As long as they're not hurting anyone, just leave people alone. Unfortunately, people will come up with all kinds of reasons as to why the way others live is hurting them, their kids, their community, or their religion, etc. And then they'll proceed to attempt to ban that way of life and exclude people based on that belief. It's a power and control dynamic. If you're not living your life the way I determine, then you are harming me and you don't have a right to exist. People will also do precisely the opposite and find reasons for why their behaviors don't affect others, in an attempt to skirt consequences and just sociopathically do whatever they feel like without consideration for others. Story 12 truly, truly hating celebrities who have zero impact on your life. For instance, Meghan Markle cannot pass legislation. She cannot fire you from your job. She has literally no effect on your life whatsoever, and yet there are entire subreddits dedicated to hating her. I can't help but think that it's kind of unhealthy. A politician actually has some sort of effect on your life. I totally get why people hate certain presidents or the CEOs of major corporations. These are people whose decisions actually impact your life, whereas Meghan Markle is just a celebrity whose decisions impact no one else but the immediate circle of people around her. I mean, feel free to hate whoever you want, but it just seems weird to be that obsessed with some celebrity, so obsessed that you spend your days talking about how much you hate them. Wouldn't it be wiser to direct all that hatred and negative energy toward someone who is actually, you know, doing something bad? I find the level of Meghan Markle hate to be truly bizarre. I have family members who have zero interest in the royal family, and we aren't even English. But if they're prompted, they'll go on deeply unpleasant rants about her that don't actually seem to touch on anything tangible. It's weird to the point of concerning. Story 13 
having to be first. It's okay if you beat me to the pump, or if you beat me to the grocery store checkout line. It's okay if you get to the freeway exit before me, or pull out in front of me on the highway. I'm patient, and it's a virtue. I swear, these people have the mindset of, I need to be first, I'm in a rush because my life is more important while driving. It bugs me so much especially when you end up next to them right where you were before, because they hit the same red light or stop sign that you do. I've literally seen people weave in and out of traffic, gunning at 15 to 20 over the speed limit whatever they had space to do, only for me to be right behind them again 30 seconds later. Their efforts made no difference in how fast they were getting where they were going, but made it exponentially more dangerous. I'm guilty of this and I'm trying to make it less of a factor in my life. Driving is the worst, but I even find myself doing it in the grocery store, anywhere there's a queue. My big realization was that, for me, it's not the need to be first or best, but it comes from operating on the assumption that other people are insufficient. It's an unhealthy worldview, it's narcissistic, and it can be outright dangerous. Story 14 True Crime I had never been into true crime beyond old Unsolved Mysteries episodes, but then I got hooked on the Idaho student murders case. I even joined all the subreddits and checked them daily, hourly if I'm being honest. I cannot believe how some people act in those subreddits. People post weird tributes like they knew the victims. People get insanely defensive of their theories of the crime. There were people posting Zillow photos of inside of the house where the crime took place, with labels showing where all the roommates lived, and they're calling it the murder house. The worst was when people jumped all over some poor dude in a hoodie who just happened to be shown on a public street camera while two of the victims got food the night of the murders. Now apparently there are subs dedicated to the suspect, who some people think is cute. True crime is morbidly fascinating, but some people take it way too far. Armchair detectives are the absolute worst. There's a high-profile missing persons case in the UK, and the comments on any news updates are disgraceful. Some of the comments are things like, they know something. You can tell by their eyes. Why aren't the police questioning them? This doesn't add up. Here's what I think, or what I want to know. These people sincerely believe that they know more than the actual detectives working in the case, and to say it rubs me the wrong way is an understatement. It's so harmful to ongoing investigations and the victims' families. I wish they'd have the self-awareness to understand that they don't know anything. They need to leave it to the professionals. It's pathetic. Story 15 QAnon. I'd say more broadly the obsession with being special or being in. I grew up with a parent who was really into conspiracy theories because they were super insecure and really wanted to be able to say, well actually, and feel like they know more than most. It's okay to not be special or in some secret club. It destroys families. I haven't spoken to my uncle in two years now. He isn't invited over for family events and my parents had to find a new church. All because I lived in California in 2020 and I didn't like a certain president. That was enough for him to call me a literal spawn of Satan, threaten to end my life and tell everyone how he hopes to see me executed on TV during the purge that he thought was going to happen. Story 16 the obsession of being thin, or other people's weight. Being skinny and healthy are not synonymous, and I'm sick of people bringing up other people's bodies when they're not asked. It's a sensitive topic for most, and they already know about their weight. Why do you feel the need to point it out? Do you really think they've never stood in front of a mirror before? Don't be concerned about my health and don't tell me it was just a compliment when you bring up my weight loss. You don't know what people are going through. A little comment on someone's body can be incredibly damaging to their mental health. Also, didn't people's mothers ever teach them if it's rude to comment on someone's appearance, or that if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all? Were these people taught anything? Being concerned about someone's health is the most ridiculous excuse to bring up anyone's weight. If you're concerned for people's health, then go donate blood or something that will actually help people. If you don't want to help people, then you aren't concerned. You're just judging them for fun. Story 17 an obsession with everything celebrities are doing. Last spring, I matched with a cute guy on Tinder who lived only a few neighborhoods down from me. We moved our conversation to Instagram and basically his entire Instagram was just photos of him with mostly D-list celebrities. In addition, he'd tag them and tell them how much he loves said celebrity, which he'd usually get a reply back, because these weren't incredibly famous people he was going out to see. Anyways, it is Tinder, and I was really just looking to get laid. He was obviously into that and was very excited because he said, 
white blonde women are his thing. So this guy and I attempted to make plans. The first time we made plans, he ditched me out of nowhere, then claimed that he just fell asleep. I didn't want to completely write him off for that, so I gave him another chance, and we made plans for a Friday night. We talked up until Friday early afternoon, and then he just abruptly unmatched me on Tinder and blocked me on Instagram. Okay. I just wrote that match off and moved on, but then funnily enough, I got a DM request only four days later, and it's that guy. He sent me a big apology about how he got too nervous because he he hadn't been intimate with anyone in a few months, and it got in his head. He felt so bad about blocking me that he wanted to unblock me and give me an explanation. At this point, I was just amused, so I basically just said, okay, and never attempted to make plans with him again. Later that day, he ended up uploading a bunch of photos from the past weekend, including that Friday where he was just hanging out at the airport waiting around for various celebrities. Some of them were just people that kind of had a following on TikTok, so basically this adult man over the age of 30 turned down getting laid by his dream type because he wanted to go stalk some barely famous TikTokers. It was just so much cringe. He still tries to hit me up. Story 18 what they eat. For some people, this obsession can turn dangerous. I work with food and my coworkers are so obsessed with being healthy that it's unhealthy. They will also make comments if people are eating unhealthily. Like just let people eat what they want. Whenever they mention something to me, it makes me feel guilty and start to overthink. It's the worst. Story 19 Pointless relationships. Settling for less just because you think you can't be alone is not healthy. I think it's even more nuanced than that, in the sense that people don't know what to truly prioritize for a successful relationship. In my 20s, I'd think of it as the biggest red flag, in terms of compatibility if the person I was dating didn't share my taste in music, books, movies, etc. I went through a ton of relationships that seemingly started out great, only to fizzle or blow up because I wasn't focusing on what makes two people actually compatible, like the ability to apologize when you're wrong, the desire to learn more about your significant other's interests, and a mutual understanding of what you both consider important versus stuff that really doesn't matter. My wife and I have completely different hobbies and tastes, and it's hands down the best and easiest relationship I've ever been in. I go to all of her games, she comes to shows with me, and through that mutual interest of getting to know each other more, we've grown more interested in each other's respective hobbies. I think this is the same for a lot of people. A lot of people don't know themselves well enough when they are young to know what is actually important to them. It takes some trial and error to learn to look for what you need and not what you want, and what things can be worked around and what are deal breakers. I have ignored my fair share of proper red flags, like different core values or incompatible goals in life, on the thinly veiled hope it would just work out because of less important things being good. But eventually, reality catches up and you realize shared hatred for pineapple on pizza is not enough. Something that kind of goes along with this is people thinking they they just haven't found a decent person. There are a lot of bad people out there, and it's not hard to imagine someone's exes all being bad, but saying I just need a decent man is naive because, no, that's actually not all you need. You need a decent man who also has the same morals and principles as you and is 100% compatible with you. Thanks for watching until the end. Please leave your story in the comments. I would love to make a video on them in the future. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe. For more videos like this one right now, please stop by our channel. Thanks again, and see you next time.